Hi everybody, um, today we are looking at how we want to get a 20 out of 20 on our biology IA3, so our research investigation. I will be showing you my IA3, um, I think I've de-identified it, and I've got the ISMG um, on the side here and I'll take you through it. Now this ISMG is not mine, I've just taken screenshots um, from the annotated response on the QCAA website so don't worry about the highlighting or anything on here um mine was a 20 out of 20 just before we start I do have a couple of things I want to say first of all um I have got some flashcards that I have made to sell to you guys um and I will be working on some external notes and checklists and all of that for later on in the year um they'll be in my Etsy which I will link for you guys um biology is massive there's 170 cards in there so I would really recommend um checking them out the other two things I want to say quickly before I start is first of all your assignment does not need to be perfect in any way to get a 20 out of 20 you just need to hit this ISMG and then the other thing is um, just make sure that you do what your teacher wants you to do um, this is what I did and this is generally what you should do but some teachers will like to have specific things in there that maybe other teachers wouldn't ask for but they really want it I know even if you don't agree with it, you should still do it anyway. And that's just because your teachers are the ones marking you, not me. So you should always do exactly what they want. So let's start off with our easy marks as we always do. And these are our communication marks. So first of all, we want to have fluent and concise use of scientific language and representations. So this basically means, is what you're saying making sense from like a grammar and um spelling point of view all those sorts of things make sure your spelling is all good something that i've actually seen recently um a friend of mine was actually marked down for this because for some reason they were using the american spelling of things so they were saying like color with one o and like they were using like a z instead of s in words like realized for example and they actually got marked down for that because it's, it's american spelling so make sure that you are spelling things correctly according to australian rules um, and just make sure that everything you're saying makes sense and you are saying it in a scientific manner. So that does mean making sure that you're speaking in like past tense, not using I, we, all of those sorts of things. And the representations, I believe, okay, for some reason I'm like missing a page there. I'm not missing a page, it's just a really big gap for some reason. When we have um, our graphs here and all that, making sure we're labeling them properly and all of that. Uh, appropriate use of genre conventions. So basically that is just um, the order of it. Um, you'll see as I move through this today, like you start off the rationale, you go with the claim and you have a title and then you go through the background information and then you get to a research question. So the genre conventions is pretty easy as long as you just follow um, either the template the teacher gives you or the order that I've done things here. The last one is our um, referencing. So this is the acknowledgement of sources through appropriate use of referencing conventions. And this comes into the reference list and the in-text referencing. So you can choose to use um, whatever like real referencing system what um, that you want. So I used APA 7. You can use Harvard. I don't know any of the other ones, but you can use any of them. QCAA actually doesn't mind as long as you use one that is real and legit. But a lot of the time your school will have a specific way of doing it. So my school policy was that we use APA 7. Um, you can just ask your teacher about that one. Now, you should have your in-text references. So where you got it from and then the year or n.d if there's no date. So we've got things like National Library of Medicine and all of that. So your rationale is likely to be more from different websites. Um, turns out that changes in uni, but um, I won't go into that. And then when you get to your evidence and all of that, it will be from like scientists with like last names and all of that sort of stuff. But make sure we have our in-text referencing whenever we have some information that, I don't know, is not really, 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 really common sense. You might think something is common sense, like what is a gene? But you still need to be able to reference that. The last thing for that is make sure you have the reference list. Make sure it is in alphabetical order and it is spaced out nicely. So I've got, I think I increased the spacing here just so when I did, you know, um, go on to the next one, it wasn't so crunched together and all of that. Have the links if you need them. Um, 
My school used a referencing generator, so I didn't have to worry about typing anything out or anything like that. But yeah, this is what it should look like and just have a little title at the beginning. Make sure your reference list is on a new page though. Technically, I could have started up here because I had the room, but that is not an appropriate use of genre conventions. So you would lose marks if you had the reference list not on its own page. You also, I don't have any tables in here, but if you did have tables or anything like that, just making sure that they don't go over pages. So those are our easy two marks. Those are the ones that we want to get no matter what, um, and they should be pretty easy to get. But let's um, get started on some of the more tricky things. So the first thing we want to look at is the informed application of DNA genes and the continuity of life um, demonstrated by a considered rationale. So that's the first part. And you need to have clear development of the research question from the claim. So everything in your research question must have been mentioned in the background or in the rationale. And it must um, relate back to the claim pretty well. So what you should do is you should start off by literally, I know it sounds a bit silly, but just stating the claim saying, it was claimed that this and my claim was diet affects gene expression in humans. So... Um, we need to unpack lots of different things here. So what we would then do is look at each thing of the um, claim. So the first thing is diet. What is diet? What are different kinds of diets? Those sorts of things. Gene expression. What is gene expression? What does it do? Again, humans, not so hard, but just make sure um, that if you can try and find studies that are on humans because the claim does specifically mention that and because the claim specifically does mention humans um you should at least like infer or imply that in your research question but let's um look at our considered rationale that we have developed from this claim here so we speak about diet first and i've got a little paragraph on diet because that is our first thing so i say what is a diet and then i come up with a diet because we can't just pick any diet it says that we want a specific and a relevant research question and to make this research question relevant i mean pardon me specific we need to get really really nuanced and pick one diet so i picked celiac disease because i have celiac disease so i was like you know what let's do this so i said a medical condition that affects a person's diet is celiac disease right so celiac disease isn't the diet, it is the medical condition. And I say what it is, it's an autoimmune disease and it reacts abnormally to gluten. And I say, what is gluten? It's a protein found in these. And then I say, so what happens when someone with celiac ingests this? I talk about um, a couple of symptoms and then I said, um, why did we pick celiac? So the diet here is gluten-free, but our medical condition is celiac disease. Now you don't need to have a medical condition linked with it if this was your claim, but I just chose to in this case. I then say, why did I choose celiac disease? Obviously I'm not gonna say because I have it. So I had to come up with a different reason. And I said, um, yes, it can cause physical symptoms, but is it affecting the patient's gene expression? Because if it's actually aff affecting this patient's genes, then that can affect the sorts of treatments or diagnoses or anything like that that we have for celiac disease. Physical symptoms does not always do not always correlate with gene expression. So that was why I was like, okay, we need to have a look at this a little bit closer. The next thing is gene expression. So let's have a talk about that one. I start off um, talking about what is a gene, what does a gene do, um, it codes for a protein, so it produces a protein, and the reason I say that is because that is what gene expression is, like the production of a protein from regulating the genes, and I do say that in here. I then say how can we change gene expression, because the key word here is effects, diet affects gene expression, so how are we actually going to change gene expression here? I say that it can be altered by transcription factors and um, I have a little bit of like a summary um, here of how we actually get to that protein. Just remember when it comes to research investigations, it is really, really easy to not include the unit three and four stuff. So you really need to make sure that you are understanding DNA, genes, and the continuity of life in regards to unit three and four. So just make sure that you always come back to it. Yeah, having this process of protein synthesis probably isn't relevant. Like you wouldn't put this in a real scientific report, but just because we want to make sure that we um, are 
relating this back constantly to what we've learned in class because at the end of the day they're assessing like how much have you learned what skills do you have how can you connect that to more difficult things that we haven't spoken about in class so you do need to start off with the basics I then say just a little bit quickly about what proteins are actually for and I say that they can also be involved in gene expression I then get to the point where I talk about how diet can affect gene expression so say we got some dietary compounds just things in I don't know, things that would you, you find in your diet. So gluten would be a dietary compound. And the, apparently, according to this reference I have here, dietary compounds can bind to regulators and control them, which means gene expression could be affected by these dietary compounds. So I go, okay, how are we going to investigate this? I look at a gluten-free diet in celiac patients, and then I want to see what is the genetic effect of either following or not following a gluten-free diet? So if a celiac person eats gluten or doesn't eat gluten, what do their genes look like? Um, I then say what will be compared. So the comparison is the difference in gene expression um, in celiac patients when they're eating a gluten-free diet and when they're not. And I did mention that all patients will be adults. Now, I just want to say this before I move on to the research question. You should make your research question and do your rationale after you've already found your sources. So I knew that I wanted to do celiac disease, but I needed to check first to see if that was actually an option. So I went onto the state library, put in celiac disease, gene expression, and then found my articles. Now, I was actually really lucky and we are very lucky. If you get a claim on gene expression or genetics, fortunately, there is so much stuff out there right now, just because that's sort of where we're at with um, science. So much stuff out there. There were heaps of articles. I found mine super duper easily. So this assignment was actually very easy for me um, compared to, say, my physics one, which sucked. Um, but yeah. So this was pretty easy. You need to use your scientific articles for evidence, though. In the rationale, it is okay. It's not okay in uni, it turns out. But for school, it's okay to use um, reputable websites. But your evidence, like this, needs to be from a scientific journal. If you don't know how to find that on like the state library or anything, um, I am planning on making a video just to show you guys how to actually do that. Now, we've got our selection of sufficient and relevant sources. Um, you can see here that I have got multiple references. So I've got one here, here, three, four, that's a repeat, five, six. And you can look, I've already got six and I'm not even halfway through. That is more than enough. And they are from reputable websites like it's not like I'm like Wikipedia so that is all good and the last thing is our specific and relevant research question so specific means that it must say what diet what gene expression what humans what are we testing and the relevant means is it actually got something to do with the claim so my claim was pretty easy um we were given a couple and this was definitely the easiest in my opinion and I said based on what I just spoke about this is our research question is there a difference in gene expression okay cool we got that back. That's relevant between adult celiac patients. So that is specific because I've mentioned adult. I've mentioned celiac. So that is very, very specific on a gluten free diet and then adult celiac patients on a gluten diet. So I've t said exactly what we are comparing here. I've been very, very specific. Now, notice how I just said, is there a difference? I haven't said how or to what extent or anything like that. In science, those are very, very, very hard to measure way too hard and you should steer clear of using them in your research questions or your conclusion is going to be really really hard to respond to your research question is there a difference is really really excellent and 100 percent valid is there a difference is a yes and a no answer saves you so many words and saves you a lot of confusion so that is our rationale let's keep moving so let's move into our evidence section so we need to Thoroughly um, identify relevant trends, patterns, and relationships, identify sufficient and relevant evidence, and then identify the limitations of the evidence. Okay, so let's first look at um, how I picked my evidence. Now, in every single research investigation, except for this one, I have always had three pieces of evidence. Now, you technically are allowed to if they are really good and they have a lot of to talk about and all of that. I would 100% check with your teacher first if you only have two. 
I originally had three, but I was like a thousand words over the word limit because they were all really good pieces of evidence. So I just had a lot to talk about. You can do two. I did. I checked with my teacher. She was like, it is completely fine. I'm not going to mark you down for it. But I really, really recommend that you check with your teacher first. So I had this piece of evidence here. And then I had this piece of evidence. And I purposely chose um, two that look different. And they look different to anything we've ever looked at before, just to really show my skills in like um, analyzing evidence and all of that. So this looks pretty complicated, um, but both of these, if we look at our um, captions, this one has the gene expression pathways on celiac patients on a gluten-free diet and celiac patients on a gluten diet. So that exactly perfectly answers my research question. And this one says, Celiac, uh, celiac, circus view of differently expressed genes, so gene expression of celiac patients when they were first diagnosed, so when they were on the gluten diet, and then when they were like a couple of years after they'd been diagnosed and they were on the gluten free diet. Again, it perfectly answers my research question. So these sources, they are relevant, they are perfectly relevant which is actually really hard to come across in research investigations and they are sufficient because i had a lot to say about them we then had to look through the relevant trends patterns and relationships so the first thing i do is say what is this table looking at what happened so i say there were three adult disease controls there were six um, adult celiac patients on a gluten-free diet and then six on a gluten diet i say exactly what it is I say the right side of the table has the different pathways um, affected by it, and that's difficult to read, but it's actually not fully relevant to the research question. So I just say such as cancers and metabolic pathways. And then I say, how did they do this? You should always have a sentence on how did they collect this data? So I said, using blood sampling, the RNA of the patients were extracted and analyzed. That's all you need to put, and it will be in the article somewhere. I then move into analyzing this data in this paragraph here. So I say, what is the difference between this red and blue? So blue has lowly expressed genes and then the red is the highly expressed genes. And then I say, okay, so how do we tell what it's meant to be? First of all, I say, when we look at the healthy control, so the people who don't have celiac disease and they're just on a gluten diet, they have majority dark blue boxes. So these genes here in these healthy controls, and I make sure that I do um, say what the healthy controls are to make it easier for your teacher. In the healthy controls, majority of these genes are lowly expressed. So they're not really expressed at all. Then later on, I compare to the celiac patients on the gluten-free diet. And I say, okay, well, majority of them are still quite low. This chunk here is the gluten-free diet, this green one. It is still pretty blue. There are a couple of patients that have a difference. And I make sure to say that could be to due to other things. We don't know what other conditions that these people have, and that is a major limitation. I then move on to talking about the people on the gluten diet. So the ones who are eating gluten are these ones in pink. I don't know why it's jumbled up, it just is. And you should be able to look at it and go, okay, the people in pink, the people who are eating gluten when they're celiac are having a lot of these genes more highly expressed for example like the cancer pathways those genes are more highly expressed so they're producing those proteins now you can see here that that is actually a massive difference so i say there's a big difference there is a significant difference and i say it is likely that the addition of gluten um does affect these things but i do talk about limitations in a moment now at the end i always do a quick summary and i say overall in response to the research question so i'm linking it back to that rationale and i did find this um data in the um research article 79 gene expression pathways were different when the celiac patients were on a gluten diet 79 so so far that is showing that the diet does have an effect on gene expression now i don't say that yet because that's for the conclusion but i do just mention what is actually going on here and then talk about my limitations and one of them is the sample size so this was in finland which has about 130,000 um, adults with um, celiac disease now you guys should know, well, actually, you might not know, but the ideal sample size when you're just in high school should be the square root 
of the um, entire population. Now, this isn't the population of Finland. This is the population of people who have celiac disease. Now, if we square root that, it should be about 360 people, but we actually only had like 12 people in this um, experiment, in this um, trial. So 12 people compared to 360, it doesn't really um, show properly what it should look like. These six people, you can see that within these six people, there is significant variance. Like this person on the far left, lots of red, whereas this person here, not so much. We really, really should have a lot more people involved. The last one says, um, the different shades of blue and red do um, sort of tell us the extent of gene expression, but we haven't quantified this at all. Like how much more significantly is the red than the blue? Like, what are we actually looking at here? We, we can only visually see this. There is no quantitative data here. So that is another limitation. The last limitation, which I might talk about in the conclusion, and I would be really surprised if I didn't talk about it at all, there is always a possibility that, say, you know, these red ones up here or something are actually caused by something different. And when it comes to biology, it's very, very important. Um, when it comes to the human body, there are so many different things going on with us. So sometimes it's not going to be because of the independent variable, but you do need to consider that. I then do the exact same thing for my second um, one. I give a summary of what the data is and how they got the data. I explain what is actually going on and I make sure that I'm using words from the syllabus, down-regulated, up-regulated, um, all those sorts of things. Now, how are we going to be insightful? I do believe there is the word insightful here. Yes, how are we going to be insightful and thoroughly identify trends? So in this situation, I can be quite insightful. And I say, although this doesn't directly address the research question, it is interesting to note that no genes on the Y chromosome are affected. So these are our chromosomes here, and this is our Y chromosome. There are no genes on that Y chromosome that are affected by this celiac disease. That is interesting. It doesn't directly answer the research question, but it sure is pretty interesting. So I do mention that. Now, um, I do say there is like a possibility. So I give a possible explanation, but obviously I don't know for sure. So I have to follow that up by saying, however, this would have to be further investigated to draw supported conclusions. And that actually gives me a really, really good extension. I then um, give my overall statement again. In this study, um, 299 genes were differently expressed. 106 of those were upregulated and 193 of those were downregulated in celiac patients on a gluten-free diet. I then quickly go through the limitations. This data doesn't specify what genes are affected or what pathways are affected. I do say that this doesn't affect our ability to answer the research question, but it does affect the depth at which we can. I again say the data is not quantitative. There is no extent to how much, like how different this regulation actually is. I then say there is a sample of 18 patients. Now, this study was in Saudi Arabia, and apparently there are approximately 230,000 Saudi Arabians with celiac disease. I really should have had a comma in there. So using our square root method, there should have been about 480 celiac patients. Now, obviously, it's going to be super duper hard to get that. But again, how well does this actually show? Um, the spread of this in Saudi Arabia. Another thing that I actually didn't mention in this assignment, I don't believe, because I didn't really know it was a thing until I actually did another gene expression assignment at uni really recently. Turns out um, your ethnicity or your geographic location can actually have a massive effect on um, gene expression. So think about it. In Saudi Arabia, which is this one, and Finland, the diets are going to be insanely different. So even though you might be eating gluten, one of these might actually eat significantly more gluten than the other country. It really just depends on like the cultural diet and all of that. Really important to mention, I didn't, which I'm ashamed of, but that's okay. Um, I still did fine without it. But if you do want to go that extra step, just mention in the um, conclusion somewhere that it is possible that ethnicity and geographic area can affect this. Um, our insightful interpretation, and we should have justified scientific arguments. So this means um, 
when we are talking, so I should have some references in here. So things like what is the population of these countries? That is justified. I can't just say, oh, well, we should have had a bigger sample size. No, I need to justify it by saying this is how many adults there are in Finland with it. Reference. According to the square root of the population, this is how many it should be. So I'm continuing to justify these ones. Um, I also believe I, I did it again in here, but along here I did do a little bit more. So justifying um, can mean a couple of different things. In chemistry, justifying meant showing the chemical equation and saying, this is what it should be. Biology, a much more difficult to justify because the human body is really, really wild and so different. Everyone is so different that our justified scientific arguments were more using the data in the um, assignment, um, pardon, not the assignment, in the evidence to justify our conclusions. Let's move on to our very last chunk here. And this is sort of like our conclusion chunk. Insightful interpretation of research evidence justified by, um, demonstrated by justified conclusions linked to the research question. These two dot points are basically exactly the same. It's just this time they want us to link it back to the research question. So we will look here and I would say, I always like to restate my research question at the beginning just to make it really obvious to the markers that you put it in there. We want to make everything as obvious as possible. Teachers get lazy. They get tired. Confirmers are the same. We want to make this as easy as them to give us those marks as possible. I then explain what both of the um, articles found and then I um, bring it back to how they corroborated the research question, etc. So I say that actually, very luckily, my articles both actually said the same thing. Amazing. So I do say that, and that is a part of justification showing that this data is likely pretty good because they are saying the same thing. I then talk about, as outlined in the rationale, scientific theory states. So this is where our justified conclusions, according to like scientific theory, really comes into play. And then I just say this evidence is supported by scientific theory. And then I keep moving and say to answer the research question, really obvious to answer the research question. This is what I'm saying. I say that, yes, there is a difference in gene expression between adult patients on the gluten free and the not gluten free diet. But then I say, yes. There is a difference, but I do need to bring up the not so good things. We do need to consider that there were a small number of patients. And when we investigate the human body, we can't assume that all celiac patients will experience the same differences, all of that sort of stuff. Really important to put in, we can't assume anything when it comes to the human body. And we have to make sure that we specify that everyone is different. Then we have our critical evaluation part where we have the insightful discussion of the quality of evidence, extrapolating back to the claim and then suggesting our improvements and our extensions. And then we are done. Uh, by the way, I did talk about the limitations of evidence after each research thing, but I think I might, I can't remember, I might restate them. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about our quality of evidence and you guys should know this framework. So you should mention all of these. I've got five dot points mentioning each one. I've got C for currency. So how old is this article? R for relevance. Is it actually relevant to your research question? One A is for authority and the other is for accuracy. Authority is where did this come from? Like, is it Wikipedia or is it somewhere better? Accuracy is, is there corroboration? Like how accurate is this actually? And P is... I don't know what the actual word is. I don't know if it's perspective or whatever, but it is. Is this biased? Has any money gone into this? Who has funded this? So I put all of my quality of evidence together because they were actually so similar and I didn't want to waste words. So both of my studies were from 2020, which is relatively recent. And I can say that, and I can also say that there has likely been no like majorly significant developments since then. Science takes a long time. 2020 was recent. So yes, it is current. So that is a tick for my quality of evidence. I do say for the relevancy that both studies address the research question actually amazingly. They literally were my research questions. So yeah, very relevant. I then have a look at our authority. Both of them are from accredited scientific journals. 
Real science, real, real science Journal is great. And the scientists, I did a bit quick Google, they are all from accredited institutions, so actual universities, all of that. So the authority is pretty good. These aren't just randoms. These are real journals, real scientists, and I could do a background check on them. Last one says, um, oh, second last one, both of them corroborate accurate data. Um, I said it suggests accurate data. I'm not saying that the data is accurate. I'm just saying that it is likely accurate. And then the last one, um, I said that they appear unbiased. Again, I can't just say, oh, they're unbiased. I can only say that they appear unbiased to myself. And then all articles will have some disclaimer about whether they were funded by specific people or not. Mine was not funded by anyone. So that means that it's likely unbiased. I then say that all of these factors mean that we've got a good quality of evidence. I make sure that I quickly restate our major limitations because then I can move into the improvements and extensions. So the major limitations were that they were qualitative and there were no actual values for us to measure the extent of gene expression. I said the relatively low sample sizes and um, I said that this limited the accuracy a little bit because we can't, um, we can't assume that all celiac patients will have the same effect. And then the last one was, um, it was unknown whether any of the healthy controls had any other diseases or environmental conditions that affected the gene expression. So some of these um, differences here, we don't know if some of these were from other diseases or other environmental conditions we simply don't know and i do say that due to the random nature of human studies like we can't address this the only way that we can fix this is to do it on more people now i do say that this only minorly affects i don't even know if minorly is a word no nah, surely it is affect the quality of evidence because i say look we could still answer the research question they slightly lower the quality of evidence because um, we should keep coming back to this quality. But overall, the evidence really wasn't that bad. I now need to extrapolate back to the claim. This one is one that a lot of people mess up. So I say it was claimed this. I restate the claim. And now I need to talk about my research for this claim. So I say that this study, so this report suggested that a gluten diet does um affect the gene expression of celiac patients. So, so far looking pretty good, except I do have to specify that it can't be confirmed whether it was like 100% that gluten diet. So I then say, okay, well, this claim can be mostly supported because it is pretty likely that it was the gluten diet that affected the gene expression, but we're not 100% sure. Then I say, and all of you should say this, however, this investigation only studied a specific niche within this claim. Looking back, I probably shouldn't have used the word niche because um, niche does mean something else in biology. Maybe I shouldn't have used that, but it didn't seem to affect me too bad. So I say to fully support this claim, we need to research more diets and more types of people. So when you extrapolate back to your claim, you should always say this study showed this. This either does support or does not support the claim. However, we can't 100% say for sure because this only um, studied a really specific part of the claim and we need to do a lot more broader investigations to truly see what's going on. Everyone should have basically the same thing for that. The last thing is that we have our improvements and our extensions, which, which should be derived from our analysis of evidence, our limitations and our quality of evidence. So improvement should be our quality of evidence. So I said to improve this, we should find studies with significantly larger sample sizes. It would reduce the uncertainty to like the human differences. The other thing was um, the major thing that I um, identified that there was no quantitative data. It was all visual qualitative data. So that was my other thing. My improvements, larger sample size and um, quantitative data. Make sure that you justify it. Say the improvement and then say why you would make that improvement. This would reduce uncertainty. This would um, do whatever. It would prove this investigation, anything like that. Extensions come from the other little things that you picked up. So I said no genes on the Y chromosome seem to have um, seem to have been affected by a celiac patient. So I then thought, okay, what's an extension? Further investigating the gluten diet on genes on the Y chromosome for more patients. And I say that this is a worthy avenue because it actually wasn't specified if any of the patients studied were male. You can then even further extend that and say, 
okay, what about other diets and the Y chromosome? Like what's going on with this Y chromosome here? That is a pretty good extension and it is comes from that really insightful um, trend that I picked up. Everything you say in your report should have meaning later on. So if I was going to mention that Y chromosome later on, I definitely had to mention it down here. Everything should be connected. The very last thing um, in this report was I said that different diets um, could be investigated and this would um, help with the claim and it can also assist in treatments and preventions for diet specific diseases. Now this was a big video. Biology reports are always the not the trickiest, but they are always very vague before, because when it comes to biology, there's no rule. Life is different. Everyone's life is different. So there is no hard and fast rule when it comes to biology, which is what makes it a bit harder. You always, always, always need to specify it. Honestly, looking back, there are definitely things in here that I would have done differently. Um, now that I've got a bit more knowledge and now that I'm out of that school space and I'm not so stressed anymore and all of that sort of stuff. But as you can see, I still got a 20 out of 20, still got confirmed perfectly fine. You don't need to be perfect to get a perfect score. I literally cannot express that enough. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. My next video will be on the physics IA3. And as we move into external and mock preparation, please let me know if there is anything that you would like me to make videos on. And yeah, thank you for watching.